All right. So just to finish off again, I'll just repeat this one more time is to finish off uh, the developmental section. I just want to hit on two kind of really important theories because you'll hear about these uh, uh, quite a bit. The first one is Erickson's socio-emotional model, which is a lifespan model. So it takes us through the lifespan. And then the one I'll talk about on Wednesday is what's called attachment theory. And it's a theory of how an infant attaches with its primary caregiver and how that leads to um, um, development throughout the lifespan. Um, I think um, one of the cool things is there was just an article, it was really interesting, uh, published that showed that how parents can actually influence uh, adolescents, quote unquote, intelligence or cognitive um, um, performance in that Positive parenting in the early years have shown to increase cognitive and academic performance in adolescents going from 12 to 16. And so that theory kind of focuses on what is important about those early years that really help the brain develop not only emotionally, but also cognitively. Okay. But the theory we'll, we'll concern ourselves with tonight is Erickson's um, socio-emotional model, okay? And this is a model, uh, Eric, Eric Erickson uh, what came out of the camp of the same as Sigmund Freud. He was a, a psychoanalyst in the beginning, but he started reading, um, uh, one of the videos that I had you watch was on Piaget and his cognitive theory, which was much more of a scientific-based theory. Um, so it kind of has some of the elements of those conflicts that you go through at each age group, but then has elements of um, more testable, more reasonable reasons why we have these conflicts at these certain periods of time. Okay, Tristan, have we gone through this? You're flipping your page, so I'm curious. Well, I think you um, told us to watch this. Oh, have we watched this? Oh, uh, no, like on our own because we were sick. Oh, so have you all watched this? Say yes, Tristan. It's kidding. You haven't? You yeah. haven't? All right. Well, let's go through it and then Tristan can help me out if I mess something up. Is that all right? <laughs> okay. And so <laughs> what What he, uh, he, he, um, Theorize is that at each age group, we're, we're fit to go through certain conflicts. It's just a kind of a perfect timing within our development. And the way I'm going to present this is in pure Erickson's form. So he felt that either in infancy, for example, you gain trust or you gain mistrust. Okay. And that's how we'll present it. But what I'd encourage you to do is to think of these things as a continuum uh, between completely being able to trust others to completely mistrusting others, okay? And we're all somewhere in between there. My best example is, is when I, you know, with, with my son and stuff, there were times that I felt like I did awesome as a dad, but I also know I'm human. And there were times I was really shitty as a dad. And so I know my son is somewhere between these two, two polar uh, sides, okay? Um, the other aspect of Erickson's model is this is a lifespan one. So this is the first one that's gonna take us com completely through the lifespan instead of just ending at 18. So that's another important part about this theory, okay? All right, so let's get through this again. She might be boring, Tristan, since she's the only one that saw it. Um, so let's start with trust mis versus mistrust. One of the things that we know about infants is that between zero to about one and a half, uh, individuals are pretty much completely biologically dependent on another person, okay? Biologically dependent, meaning they can't feed themselves, uh, they can't warm their and comfort themselves, they can't shelter themselves, um, and you know um, uh, they even rely on each other's to to take care of their waste products. Okay, 
And it's not until about one and a half to two years old where an individual starts creating, uh, developing some type of uh, biological sustainability, be able to feed themselves, warm themselves, and whatnot. So Erickson's felt that this was the perfect time to develop a sense of trust or mistrust for, for uh, other people, okay? And so what does pure trust versus pure mistrust look like, okay? Trust looks like something like this. This, this is an example, right? Uh, and we'll use mommies, okay? Uh, baby cries, mommy shows up, feeds baby. And then there's this unique moment, especially after about six weeks of birth, where baby smiles at mom, mom smiles at baby, and they have this moment. They have this reciprocal moment, okay? Mom goes away, baby cries, mom shows up, changes the baby, they have that moment. Mom leaves, baby cries, mom shows up, and they go through another something, okay, comforting or something like that, okay? And what Erickson felt like the infant was learning um, in this phase was trust, that, that if you have a need that needs fulfilled, someone will show up. And as long as you reciprocate that appreciation through that moment, then they will show up the second time, okay? Now, um, on the mistrust end is something more like um, well, you know, kids under one and a half year old, they don't have language, okay? So in this context, what I want you to do is imagine the emotions because our first language is emotions. And infants can understand emotions just as good as adults can, if not better. So when I do this, I want you to interpret the emotion, not exactly what I say, okay? So baby cries, no one shows up. 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 Baby cries, mom comes in the room and says, what do you need now? I'm watching TV and you're bothering me. What could you possibly need? Okay. Again, feel the emotion, not the words. As adults, we can interpret the words. What is the child learning in this uh, uh, scenario? One, they can't get all their needs filled. They can't trust other people to show up when they need it. And when people do show up, they're, you know, quote unquote, mean. They're, they, 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 they don't want to be there. They don't want to be a part of that. Okay. And in Erickson's terms, what the infant is learning is mistrust, that, that you can't rely on other people, okay? Now, again, we, lay all, we all lay somewhere between the two um, extremes, all right? Now, again, on Wednesday, we'll delve into this deeper by extending it to something that, like I said, called attachment theory, which is an extension of this where we will learn different, what we call attachment styles based on our experience with those close to us, okay? But for now, let's move on. All right. So we go from trust, and again, if, if nothing changes in the child's life or the person's life, everything stays the same, what's set up in one stage sets them up to be more successful in the next stage. So uh, if nothing changes, we have trust heading towards autonomy, mistrust heading towards shame or doubt, okay? Now, I mentioned earlier about the mother-child dance in infancy where mom fulfilled a need and then they had that moment of reciprocation. This extends as the child becomes mobile, because what happens when you become one and a half, two years old? Well, if you know anyone that's that age, they get into everything. They're exploring their world. They're trying to figure out what this world is all about. And so this is a perfect age to learn how to be autonomous um, or feeling like you can't be, you can't explore or that you that, that whatever you do is wrong, OK? 
Okay. So what does the child mother dance look like when we get a bond of beyond one and a half years old? It looks like something like this. So the little Ty goes and plays in his room or her room for 15 minutes and then goes and checks on mom and just says, hey, mom, here I am. And then the child goes and starts to play it again for another 10, 15 minutes. And then we'll go see mom and say, hey, just checking on you, getting close to lunch, maybe, you know, something good. And then goes back and plays. And it, it does this interaction between going and exploring and then going back to mom because mom is that secure base. It provides that feeling of safety. Okay. And so what's a child learning is that they can be autonomous. And as long as they reinforce those relationships with their secure base by going back and forth, they can explore the world freely and safely, knowing that if they get in trouble, someone will show up. So on the other side, we have shame or doubt. Shame feeling like I'm just not worthy. I just can't do it. Um, and so this is a child who has two types of behaviors. Either it's that child who is over clingy to mom, the one that doesn't leave mom's side and wrapped around her leg all the time. And when taken away, it has a, it, it has a very visceral physical response, either violently or angrily. Or it's the child who just doesn't give a crap about anyone. It's the one that just goes and, and has nothing to do with the world, okay? Why, why do these kids do this? Because that feeling of shame, they don't feel like they can really integrate into the world and have people there to help them be secure. So these are children who are either entering into high-risk behaviors or children who are not willing to explore the world, okay? And then again, if we uh, don't have anything that changes and we get into the play age, uh, remember what I said about this three to five when we were talking about Freud is the important phase about this the important activity uh, during this stage is um, um, role playing and play. Um, and indeed, again, I'll go back to current research we're finding that children who spent more time playing during this age group versus learning how to spell ABC or sitting and doing some type of ac academic activity that will prepare them for formal education, the children who spent these years in play actually outperform those other children academically and cognitively, okay? That's how important we're finding that play is during these years. Um, and again, it, on, on the social end, what are children doing? They're trying to figure out who they are, what roles they can take on. So they'll play, uh, you know, um, 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 mom and dad, they'll play doctor patient, they'll play Superman, Supergirl, um, you know, and try to take on those different type of things to see what works out. Because again, when we get to personality, which we'll explore when we get through social psychology, personality, who you are as an individual, tends to be set by about the age of five. That's when you know, your person, your extroversion, introversion, openness versus closeness, all of those type of dynamics are pretty well set by the age of five, albeit unless something extreme happens in your life. So... Uh, what does this set up according to Erickson's model? It sets up for initiative versus guilt, okay? Initiative being that child who um, takes control of their environment. They, they, they say, um, hey, Molly, let's go play um, doctor. Let's go play um, um, on the playground. Let's go, let's go do something, okay? Um, and, and they take that initiative to enter into a social situation, uh, make those friendships, do those things, and the like, okay? Versus guilt, so shame is doubt that you can do something. It's that 
thing that says, I can't do that. Guilt is not feeling like you're capable. Okay. It's, it's, if I do something, I'm probably did it wrong. Okay. Um, and so this, again, this is really a continuation of the early childhood age, because what we find is, is that these children either become over attached to a caregiver. Um, and again, when separated, become aggressive and, and the like, or that's a person who, you know, at the house party, two, three hours in, someone says, hey, where's Billy? And they find him five, six blocks down playing in the neighbor's yard. Um, and again, it's just creating that schasm between being able to be part of the group or, as you would say, pack, or um, not being able to uh, be, be on your own, be, be uh, initiative, okay? All right. In the next phase, um, again, if nothing changes in the child's environment and those types of things, what Erickson felt in the next phase, which is a school age, is the ability to develop either industry versus inferiority, okay? What's happening during this age group is we're starting to look towards peers for feedback about how we're doing and what we're doing. We're starting to develop friendships outside of siblings and, and parents. And we're looking to see whether or not we have value beyond our family and our, our siblings, okay? And so what uh, Erickson felt is that this was a period of time to develop what he called either industry or inferiority, okay? And maybe the example of industry is uh, at home, Billy strums on a guitar and mom and dad go, oh, Billy, you're going to be our rock star someday, so Billy decides, well, you know, if mom and dad think I'm good at this, uh, I'll take my guitar to school. And that school plays on a guitar and all of his friends are, gosh, you're so good at that, Billy. We're going to make the greatest rock band ever, blah, blah, blah. And what Billy is learning in this situation is what Billy does has value to other people. It has meaning to other people. It's just not purposeful for himself. Okay. Inferiority on the other extreme is Billy plays on the guitar and dad comes into the garage and says, Billy, I told you not to play that garbage when I'm home, only when I'm at work. Okay, So Billy figures, well, if dad's a stick it, I'll go to school. And so Billy strums on the school guitar at school and all of his friends and peers say, Billy, you really, you really should try something else. Well, you, you suck. Okay. What Billy is learning in this, this example is that what Billy is doing has no value to other people. It's not industrious. And so Billy starts to feel inferior to those who are industrious. Okay. Now, this actually, this, this industry versus inferiority actually set up some of the early theories of bullying. Okay in that um, uh, bullies are individuals who, according to Erickson, developed inferiority. So they enter into bullying behavior because they feel that they have no value in the world. So they're going to make it so other people don't have value in the world, and that makes them feel better. Okay. Um, we'll get into some other bullying theories about bullying when we get to social psychology uh, but that has been one of kind of the leading ideas is that what we need to do is enhance a, a bully's ability to think that they themselves have value without being deprecating to other individuals and not having to be uh, violent or, or, or verbally aggressive towards others. Um, but we'll evaluate that when we get to that section, because what we'll actually find is that many bullies have an inflated self-esteem about themselves and those kind of programs tend to actually inflate their uh, esteem more, creating the possibility of even more bullying behavior. So we'll get into that when we get to social psychology. It's kind of an interesting conversation, so. All right.
So through our school ages, and then we start to hit puberty and what happens during puberty, well, we start to physically develop into our um, adult um, uh, bodies. And what Erickson felt happened during this uh, phase is because I'm full physically changing, I must be psychologically changing too, okay? I'm becoming different from my family in a sense, okay? And if you want to put it in this terms, if you kind of go ask an adolescent, for example, um, who they are versus a six-year-old, okay? An adolescent will usually say something like, um, I don't know, I'm a soccer player, or I'm a runner, um, I'm a academic, uh, you know, I'm good at school. They'll they'll say something that is a uniquely about them that they that that that, that they like. If you ask a six year old who they are, they'll usually say, uh, you know, I'm John and Jane's son. Okay, they, they'll identify with their family rather than identify with themselves. Okay, and what Erickson believed is this was the perfect time for an individual to develop identity versus role confusion, okay? But to explain this, we need to talk a little bit about identity and identity formation, all right? So I'm gonna try and draw a circle. And what this really crappy looking circle represents is something we call a self-concept, okay? A self-concept is everything that you can say is you, okay? Um, it's all of your qualities, you know, you know uh, how you identify with your gender, how you identify with your culture, your ethnicity. It's how you feel as far as your personality. It's all your personality factors. This can be divided into two. Um, uh, one is your social identities. Those are those identities that are given to you by your social world, uh, such as a, a son, daughter, um, student, professor, uh, worker, um, unemployed. I don't know. Uh, the occupational identity, that's, that's the, probably a better term. And then your personal identity is all those things that make you uniquely you. Those are your personality factors and all those kinds of things. And the question has become is what is a healthy identity? What is What makes someone healthy as far as their identity is concerned? So let's, and what we have learned, and I know this sounds kind of strange, is that a healthy identity is a person with multiple identities. No, that sounds strange, but stick with me. We'll get there. All right. And what I mean by that is we'll put, we'll just use five of them here, is it's a person who can identify with all aspects of their life. So uh, let's take a, maybe this individual is good at, uh, you know, good at soccer. So she identifies as a soccer player or an athlete. Maybe she's good at math, so she identifies with math and that math identity of being able to do math. Um, maybe she's a good sister, and, and so she identifies as a sister, okay? Uh, maybe she identifies as a girlfriend. Um, and then uh, let's say, um, what's another one? Um, she identifies, let, let's do with a personal identity. She identifies as someone who is outgoing and extroverted, okay? Now, what makes this as a healthy identity is that one is if you invest in all of those, you become a whole and more complete person. But the benefit of it is, let's say, so maybe this one was a girlfriend identity, okay? And let's say... Um, the boyfriend or the girlfriend broke up with her. And so that crushes that identity. But because she has all of these other identities that she invests in and understands, she's not a completely crushed individual. She kind of can go, well, you know, I got to work on this one, but I'm still a good athlete. I'm still good at math. I'm still a good sister. I can't remember what the fourth one was. I'm still good at all these other things. So they retain a sense of self. They retain a sense of self-esteem, okay? This is what we call a healthy identity. Now, 
So that that's on that positive end of identity. What's on the negative end? What is role confusion? Okay. Well, role confusion is when your identity is wrapped up in one single identity, one single aspect of the self. Okay. And let me go over the second type of role confusion, and then I'm going to come back to this one. The second type of role confusion is when you ask uh, an adolescent or a young adult who they are, and they say, well, you know, I'm not a jock, I'm not a stoner, I'm not, an I'm not good at school, I'm not one of them, I'm not one of these. And then you go, but who are you? And they continue with a list of who they're not. Okay. This is a person who really has no sense of identity. They just know who they don't want to be, but they haven't developed a sense of who they are. Okay. In this first example, um, it's someone who wraps himself completely into one singular identity. And probably my best uh, example of this is when I, when I worked at a behavioral health center at another college that had a football team. Okay. Now, this college had a unique recruitment strategy. Uh, they, they had a very, very good football team, very high-performing athletes. But their recruitment was, as they went to other university and colleges and recruited those athletes who were being kicked out of those other institutions for some behavioral or academic reason. So, uh, so that got them really good players but it got what we would call last chance players. I mean, this college was those individuals last chance to make it to the NFL or make it to a tier one or whatever university where they could live out their college, uh, their football identity, okay? Every about December and January, I always ended up with, with uh, football players who uh, started to act out. They started to over drink. They started to over party. They got in fights. Um, yes, and I will say this openly. This is when a lot of sexual assault from football players started to happen. And, and they just started very decompensating from each other, with, from themselves. They started just really um, almost completely self-destructive. All right. And so I would bring them into my office and I would say, what's going on? Why are you, you, you were doing fine. You had no behavioral issues or anything up until this point. And what would happen is they usually said, well, I'm in my second year. And so I know after this year, I'll no longer be here. And I wasn't recruited to the NFL and I wasn't accepted to any other u university programs. And so I don't know what I'm going to do. And I'd ask them, well, what do you mean by that? And they say, my entire life has been based upon being a football player. I know nothing else. I know no other identity other than this one single identity that both my parents and myself gave to myself. And so what was happening is because that identity was crushed, they became very self-destructive and even destructive to the end of harming other people, okay? On the other end, there were some football players who realized it was their last chance, and so they started to invest either in their academic programs or something like that, and they didn't necessarily go through these issues, okay? So this first type of role confusion is when an individual only tightly identifies with one singular aspect of themselves, and that's all that they are, okay? And again, we see the self-destructive nature. We see in the second one where the person um, doesn't identify with anything, anything that they tend to have a lot of turnover rates with work. They're constantly dissatisfied with jobs and where they're at. They have a difficult time with relationships because who do they know who they want to be with if they don't even know who they are? And so we see those type of outcomes for these two types of role confusions that we see developed through adolescence. Do those make sense? Okay, with those. Okay. 
All right. Again, we're assuming that nothing changes through the lifespan. And so we're going to go into the next phase, which is young adulthood. Um, and definitely into young adulthood, especially getting into 18. And this age has actually been extended. Young adulthood now goes 18 to 35. And then middle adulthood goes from 35 to 65. Um, I just haven't updated this table yet. Um, is 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 uh, uh, when when we ask young adults, you know, what is it that you're really looking for, and what you're really going for, and um, and this isn't this is average, okay? I'm, I'm not necessarily saying this is you guys, but this is on average, okay? There's a lot of deviations from this, um, and then you know, a lot of comments saying, well, well, get a house, get a job, become stable, blah blah blah. And then we measure it <laughs> and we find out that, uh, you know, if we go with uh, guys versus girls, guys think about it every 90 seconds. Girls think about it every third, three to four hours on average. And every 90 seconds for guys, it's about sex. Every three to four hours, it's about sex for women on average. Okay. Again, there's deviation in that. Um um, someone in here is going, oh, gosh, I never think about it. Someone else is going, it's on my mind every 10 seconds. So that, that's a deviation, okay? Um, and we realize what individuals are really looking for during this period is someone to be with, somebody that they can call their partner, uh, someone they can develop a family with. And so in, in Erickson's terms, this is intimacy versus isolation, Okay. And we'll look at healthy versus unhealthy relationships, healthy intimacy, unhealthy intimacy when we get to later in the course. But right now, intimacy is this ability to get into a relationship. So it re requires a good amount of trust, intuition, intuitiveness, um, industry, and a good sense of identity. Okay. On the other hand, if we have a sense of mistrust, shame, guilt, inferiority, role confusion, this can result into what's called isolation, okay? And don't think of this as physical isolation. This is psychological isolation, okay? And again, just like the rest of these, there's kind of two forms of psychological isolation, okay? One form of psychological isolation is when the person invests all of their energy into non-human objects, okay? So this is the person who becomes a workaholic. This is a person, uh, I use very stereotypical terms, this is a person that becomes the do dog guy or the cat woman, okay? They choose to invest in things that are non-human or non-human relationship, okay? Um, on the other form of isolation is someone who really, really does want to be in an intimate, healthy relationship, but around three to six months, they have a tendency to dump that person and jump into another relationship, okay? And what is happening in this situation it has to do with kind of the dating world, Right. When we start dating someone, we usually try to put out our best self, okay? So we'll shower before the date. Um, if we're having them over, we'll make sure the dishes are done. Um, we will, uh, you know, try to um, get rid of all our BO and all those kinds, and, and we'll put our best self forward, okay? The problem is, is human beings are not that good at that. Eventually, those things are going to boil over, okay? And what usually happens in a relationship around three to six months is you come go over to your partner's house and you notice the dishes aren't done anymore. <laughs> the house isn't always vacuumed or cleaned. Um, you're sitting by them and they, you know, lift a butt cheek and fart. And all of those bad human habits that we think of start to leak out. And what that does is not necessarily gross a person out, but what it does is it brings reality to the relationship. Okay. It takes away kind of that fantasy of two perfect individuals who are acting perfect around each other away. The other aspect of around the three to six months is, you, you know, you go to your apartment and you notice that there's two toothbrushes in the bathroom instead of one. 
uh, you notice that um, uh, there's another key on your key ring. Um, and you notice that uh, you know they're 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 contacting and asking where you're at a lot more often, um, and this brings up the notion of commitment, okay? And that um, we're about to be so we're being real, and there's a notion of commitment starting to occur. And if you think about the person who doesn't trust anybody, who is feeling constant shame and guilt and doesn't really have a good sense of identity, this becomes really scary. So what do these individuals do? They jump right out of that relationship, but because they want a relationship, they almost instantly jump into another one. And in some cases, they're already starting to develop a relationship with someone else. So they, they, there's not that immediate uh, period of time where there's not someone there. Okay, that's the second type of uh, psychological isolation that Erickson found in this developmental phase, okay? And again, we're all in between. All right, and then the next two phases, which we'll get through, is uh, intimacy goes then to what we consider generivity versus stagnation, okay? Now, what happens during middle adulthood is we go through this evaluative period. So we've built the relationships, we've built, starting to build the family, we've, we're, we've done all of these things. And we go through this evaluation period where we start to look back and on one end of the continuum, on the generivity end of the continuum, we look back and we go, you know, I've had, I've been married for, you know, going on 30 years now. We're still in love. My kids are doing well. One's going to college. One's going to graduate from high school soon. Well, they waited quite a while to have kids. Anyways, um, at work, I'm doing well. And all of things are going well. And so what they do is they think, well, if life was good to me, then I need to give back to life. Okay. And so this is where you get the middle-aged person who starts to uh, be part of nonprofit boards, start to donating more of their time to their church, um, uh, spending time at the food kitchen, um, and, and doing more community-based activities. This is where you see a lot of individuals start to enter into politics to try and improve their community, okay? And so this is a person who has generivity. Now, there's some challenges to this because we actually find that, uh, you know, when people donate to, to uh, uh, charities, it's the person who has actually went through life difficulties who are more likely to donate to a charity than a person who has went through life with privileges. Um, and we're finding that younger generations today are starting to do more time donation than, than are this middle age. So there's some challenges to that idea, but that's kind of the basic idea. Probably something that is kind of real during this period is the notion of stagnation. Okay, This is when a person looks back on their life and they're like, all right, I'm on my third divorce. One of my kids is in jail. The other one is failing high school. Um, I'm on my 12th job. Um, um, I can't pay rent, so I'm constantly moving. And they look back and they go, you know, life has shit on me. Okay, life has not been good uh, uh, to me. And so this is a person who goes through one of two phases. Again, that two-phase idea. In one... It's a person who goes back, kind of regresses back in life and tries to figure out what they missed. What was it in life they missed that has made them so miserable? So again, on a stereotypical level, this is where the, you know, the, the 50 year old starts dating a 20 year old and now has a sports car. Okay. On the stereotypical end, this is when the woman goes and, you know, gets some body argument, augmentation um, and starts to use a lot of beauty products and those kinds of things to make herself feel useful. Uh, useful, again, stereotypical the example, but the idea is, is it's a person who goes back and tries to figure out what they missed during their 
their upbringing. Okay. Now, I, I will say that there is a, a, a portion of the population that does do this. Uh, we don't necessarily call it a midlife crisis anymore, but the, this type of mode of behavior actually creates a lot of havoc in a lot of homes. Yeah, it usually ends in divorce, it ends in losing a house, it ends up losing jobs, it ends up hurting kids. And so this really is a destructive thing that we see with a small portion of individuals. The other version of stagnation is a little bit more positive. It's where an individual goes and says, you know, I must have missed something, so maybe I need to change. And it is very common. We're, we're seeing this more and more where uh, during 35, 40-year-olds are, 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 uh, that, that are unhappy and stuff, we're seeing an increase in those individuals going back to school uh, and doing a new career or adjusting career and making life changes. Okay, So that's the other version of stagnation. All right. We're almost there, gang. Then we get into the last phase of life, all right? And again, this is all dependent on nothing changing through this person's entire life. Um, is ego, e ego integrity versus despair, okay? Now this is here regardless of a person's belief system about afterlife and all those kinds of things, okay? So please understand this, this is not a spiritual or a religious conversation. But what happens when we start to get into later age and we start losing our siblings, our parents and our close friends and those kinds of things. And as we we uh, come to the conclusion that, holy crap, I am going to die someday. Um, and it's it's unavoidable. And we start to think, well, what is going to make us humanly immortal? What's going to make me remembered? What's going to make my grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and great-great-grandchildren remember me? Or even just my family and extended family remember me after I'm gone, okay? And again, individuals do a, a life scan. So a person with ego integrity goes, you know, you know, I, I've been married. Yeah, I got divorced once, but I've been in a healthy marriage. It's been going on for 30, 40 years. Uh, my kids are doing great. They come and visit. I made that one change at work that will live on and, and, and whatnot. So this is an individual who is going to spend the rest of their life with what we call ego integrity, meaning that they know that they're going to be remembered after they leave so they can live the rest of their life with happiness and joy and blah, blah, blah. Okay. Uh, versus a person who ends their life with despair. This is an individual who looks back and realizes they really didn't do anything in their past. Uh, they didn't keep good intimate relationships. None of their family members ever even come visit them anymore. And this is a person who just says, okay, I'm, my life has been worthless. And so let's, let's, let's finish it. And so this is, again, in the stereotypical term, the person who shows up to the nursing home and just sits in the rocking chair and waits for their life to, to waste away. So, all right. Now, a few things, a few criticisms about Erickson's model. Um, one is, remember, you got to keep things on a continuum. Two, life situations, life changes can influence this trajectory. Just because you had a horrible childhood doesn't necessarily mean you'll have a horrible adulthood, that things you put into your life can change the way life ends, okay? And that's one of the criticisms about his model is he said it was very fixed, but we've learned ever since then that you can put things into life that can either make life better or can make life worse, okay? And that these aren't necessarily set. The other criticism is when we get into adulthood, is that we know that there's a lot more diversity in adulthood and not just these two um, areas of, of, of um, um, placement, whether I feel like I had a good life versus a bad life or I had a meaningful life or a non-meaningful life. It's much more complex than that. Okay. Any questions? Okay with that? All right.
Did I did I hit everything? Okay, thank you. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing for right now. All right, um, Drea, do you have any questions? No. All right, good. All right. So this is one more night of long lecture. Uh, we get through one more on Wednesday. And then when we come back, we'll do a little bit more activity based class. Okay. Does that sound good to you all? All uh, right, me too. Okay. Well, let's get out of here for tonight. Remember anything before tonight, we're not going to worry about assessment or anything. All the content that you'll be responsible started tonight. Thank you for coming. And we